So my name's Ray Rogers. I'm the Deputy Director of the Robinson Research Institute here at the University of Adelaide, and I'm Chair of their theme, Infertility and Conception. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, who are the original custodians of the land we're on, um, and the other campuses of the University of Adelaide, and acknowledge them as the original custodians of that land. So thank you very much for all coming tonight. Um, it's going to be a great session, and it's called An Apple a Day. You notice that they've left the end of the phrase off that says, keep the doctor away. I guess that's because the AMA would be very upset if we used the whole title. So it's just an apple a day. So as you can gather, it's all about your health. Um, this is an important area, and you'll notice that you'll see a lot of things on social media and in the media itself, giving all different tips on different lifestyles, different diets, different nutritional facts, and sometimes they can appear a bit conflicting. So what we've done for tonight's program is bring together three learned young people from our university here. I can say young people because I'm now over 60. Um, and they're going to tell us a little bit about some of their research and their research interests. And you'll see that uh, they're quite diverse, but they'll come together hopefully as a theme at the end. So the format is they're all going to have a, about a 10 minute presentation. Um, and then we're going to sit, get them to sit up the front here. I'm going to fire a few questions at them. I've already had a couple of questions submitted to me from the audience, um, and we'll see if they can handle those and give us some good knowledge and good tips and things to do. And then we're going to open it up to you, the public, uh, for general questions. So um, the people that we've got, um, their names are up here, and I'll introduce them as they come up here. Um, but we're going to talk about the environment, and your gut, and it's linked to chronic diseases like diabetes and cancer. We're going to hear about differences between various types of sugars that are present in common foods. And we're going to hear about how chemicals can impact your fertility. So it's a combination of nutrition and fertility tonight. OK. So I think we need to get underway. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Laura Weyrich, she's an Australian Research Council Future Fellow here at the University of, the, of Adelaide at the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA, and I'm hoping she's going to tell us what ancient DNA is. Um, I don't think I qualify as having ancient DNA just yet, but I'm not <laughs> far off it. Um, she investigates how cultural changes, um, dietary shifts and, and disease shape our human microbiome. She also investigates how the evolution of microorganisms affects today's diseases and how they've changed during the course of human evolution. So quite an interesting topic. So welcome, Laura. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And I'm so excited to be here tonight to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, the human microbiome. And so we'll jump straight into it. I'm not going to talk about ancient DNA tonight. I'm not going to talk about ancient hominids. It's a very exciting topic. But I'm going to talk about the bacteria that lived inside of those individuals and that live inside of all of us tonight. And we refer to <clears throat> many of these microorganisms that live inside of us as microbiota. These are all the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, the archaea, the eukaryotes, the parasites, all of those little microscopic animals that live on and in every single one of us. And this accounts for about three pounds, or 1.4 kilograms, of your total body weight. So if you step on the scale in the morning and you're a little upset with the number, you can blame your bacteria. <laughs> What's fascinating about this, though, is that there's 1,800 species that live on and in every single human. And that accounts for about 100 trillion bacterial cells. 100 trillion in every single one of you. Now, that's a huge number. It's hard for me to wrap my head around 100 trillion. But if you turn each of those bacteria into a millimeter, you could still go around the Earth 2,500 times. So it's an enormous number in every single one of us. And that means that greater than half of the total cells in our body are actually microbial. Stop and think about that for a second. You actually thought you were a human. Turns out you're just a host. You actually have more microorganisms on you than you do your own cells. And you begin getting these microorganisms the very first second that you came into this world. 
whether you're born via vaginal birth or you're born via cesarean section, actually has a major influence on the types of microorganisms that you pick up in those first few seconds of life. And there's a beautiful coevolutionary story here. Actually, vaginal microbes are predominantly in Western women called lactobacillus, meaning bacteria that eat milk. And so your mother's vaginal microbes were actually given to you to allow you to digest milk in those first few days of life, a beautiful sort of evolutionary type gift. And in those first few days, you sort of move beyond having lactobacillus to having a very sort of diverse microbial community that continues to grow in diversity. Much like a butterfly collector, you continue to grab and to maintain different microbes that sort of suit your own collection. And when you're about three years old, these microorganisms within your gut will stabilize. And these will primarily be most of the microorganisms you carry with you over your entire life. Now, if you're in the mouth, those organisms take about seven years to sort of um, stabilize, but in the gut, at least when you're three years old, you sort of have your, your adult microbes. It's not just these microorganisms themselves that are important, though. It's the functions and the information that they carry with them that become absolutely critical for human health. And we refer to these genomes and all of their sort of environmental information as the microbiome. And the microbiome is the term that gets typically used in the news and in the media, but this actually refers to genomes rather than, rather than microorganisms themselves. What's fascinating about this, though, is that in every single human, there's two to five million microbial genes. Two to five million. To put that in contrast, the human genome, in a very, very um, high estimate, would have about 30,000 genes. So that means that 99% of your genetic makeup within your body is actually microbial. 99%. And that actually explains why when we sequenced the human genome, we didn't necessarily have all the answers we thought we would have to health and disease. It's because we missed 99% of what's in every single one of you. And that 99% is a highly variable genome. It's something that can change, and it's something that's unique to every single person sitting within this room. These functions that are encoded within these genomes are actually incredibly, incredibly important for our daily physiology. Some of the things help us make us be actually humans. And the first one is that they help us digest our food. So obviously you have you know, thousands of species of, gut, of bacteria in your gut, and these are helping you digest everything that you put into your mouth. And so they're breaking down complex carbohydrates, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of this talk, and they're really sort of uh, allowing you to access nutrients from food that otherwise you don't have the enzymes to consume. And in doing so, in many cases, they actually produce byproducts that are also beneficial. Things like vitamins. Vitamin B and vitamin K are actually not necessarily obtainable from your diet alone. You actually have to rely on microorganisms that live within your gut to produce those vitamins for you. Pretty great relationship. But it's not just food that actually they digest as well. It's also anything that goes into your mouth. So any pharmaceutical you took, some paracetamol this morning perhaps, was actually digested by microorganisms before it was sort of presented to your body. And so depending on the type of bacteria you have and depending on how many of those bacteria you have can actually play really big influences into how your body metabolizes pharmaceuticals and metabolizes drugs. So in the future, we may actually give you a pharmaceutical and a probiotic at the same time to ensure that that efficacy is actually where it should be. In the same aspect, many of these bacteria can actually digest drugs in a harmful way. Sometimes toxicity from pharmaceuticals actually comes because you have a different type of microorganism in your gut that will digest a drug in a harmful way. They also help develop your immune system. Perhaps this is obvious, bacteria and immunity go hand in hand, but they actually do things very early in life to train and to educate your immune system, to really teach it when to react and when not to. And in the same hand, they also help protect you from infectious diseases. You have to remember that you're a host for all these species, and they want to sort of keep that host. They don't want any invaders coming in. And so your host microorganisms, your host microbiota, are constantly at war, fighting off other species and preventing many pathogens from entering into your body. And last but not least, they help detoxify your environment. Things that could have been toxic, bacteria can actually metabolize in unique ways and, and help deal with those. Now in humans, that's not as, as big an issue, although we will talk about some of that tonight. But if you're a koala and you're eating eucalyptus every day, that's quite a toxic environment, and you're actually gonna rely on those gut microorganisms to help you eat your own food and, and not, be, um, not succumb to toxicity because of that. <clears throat> So obviously, because these microorganisms play such critical key functions in our health, if you alter those functions, you're going to get disease. And so this has been one of the biggest scientific revolutions in the past 10 years that we've seen. And we've really been linking these diverse microbial communities to many of the different diseases that we've known and studied for years and years. 
we essentially have to go back to the starting gate and, and really sort of reevaluate diseases in a new, new lens and a new framework to understand how gut microorganisms and how microbiota in general may contribute to diseases. And so many of these um, have been looked at in great detail. And the first one that really came onto the scene was obesity. And so here you have a leptin-2 knockout mouse on the left, that quite obese but rather cute mouse. And then on the right, you have the lean mouse. And you can actually take microorganisms from the gut of the obese mouse, insert them into the lean mouse, and cause that lean mouse to become obese. Microorganisms in this scenario are sufficient to cause obesity. They didn't have to change the diet. They didn't have to change anything else. All they did was change the microorganisms and cause obesity. Unfortunately for us, it doesn't work the other way around. You can't take the lean microorganisms and give them to the obese mouse and fix that. It's a more complicated system than that. But we certainly know that microorganisms can not just contribute to disease or not just be a knock-on effect from a disease, but actually cause a disease. And so there's been, again, tons and tons of diseases that have been investigated to date. Many of them are in the gut, but a lot of them are elsewhere in the body and relate to things that we couldn't even have imagined. So one of the things I think is most fascinating is that the gut microbiome is now being linked to mental health. There are clinical trials in the United States that are working on treating schizophrenia with antibiotics. That sounds crazy, but it's just by dealing with the gut microorganisms in our bodies to think about treatments for disease that we can come up with, with new scenarios and new pathways. What's fascinating about these, though, is that they change, these microorganisms change according to so many different things in our lifestyles and so many different things in our environment. It's actually hard to, to come up with a prescriptive way to tell you know, everybody's microbiomes to change in, in the same way to re result in the same sort of health increase. And that's because the microbiome responds to pretty much everything that anyone's investigated to date. <laughs> we know that your genetics play a role. The type of genes you have within you will help select for particular microorganisms. We absolutely know that diet plays a huge role in the type of microbes that you have within you. Actually changing your diet drastically can change your gut microbiome in as quickly as 24 hours in some capacities. But also getting a disease and treating that disease can change your microbiome pretty substantially. But there are also sort of minor effects that we see. Just living in a particular environment and being exposed to particular things on a daily basis can contribute to changes within your microbiome. Even sharing your house with your pet has been shown to sort of alter the bacteria you carry with you. In fact, somebody can actually link your pet to the owner based on certainly the microorganisms that you share with uh, your dog. So think about that the next time they give you a kiss. But what my group is doing is looking at all these factors combined and looking at them throughout the past. But what we see and what other groups are seeing around the world is that industrialization and modernization, i.e. living in a city, a beautiful city like Adelaide here, actually is the single biggest factor that drives changes in the microbiome. And so certainly here in this, this plot where every single dot represents an entire microbiome from a single individual, we can see that anyone from an industrialized country, doesn't matter if you're in Australia, the United States, or Europe, looks more similar to one another than other individuals who live sort of hunter-gatherer type lifestyles. So industrialization always kind of makes us look the same, microbially speaking. And unfortunately for us, that sameness is associated with a decrease in microorganisms. That essentially means that industrialization and our modern lifestyles are killing off many of our gut microorganisms. We're now in this plague of missing microorganisms that we should have, evolutionarily speaking, and simply don't now. And so we're trying to tease apart what these particular factors are and how these individual factors of an industrialized lifestyle are actually contributing to this missing microbe phenomenon that we see today. And this could be things in our diet. It could be minimal outdoor exposure. Did anybody here today walk on green grass? A couple people? But some of you also probably only walked on cement all day, and that's the big difference there. Also, exposure to antibiotics, antimicrobials, pollutants can all have an impact, again, on our microbiome in industrialized societies. Early birth alterations and, and sort of limiting of vaginal birth can influence that, and low amounts of exercise uh, can also contribute. So how might we go about fixing the microbiome or improving that microbial diversity or introducing some of these lost species back into our bodies? Well, there's multiple ways of doing this. One is probiotics, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. You've all been told to eat yogurt when you were given your antibiotic and that these lactobacillus and bifidobacterium species within fermented cheeses and, and things like that are quite good for our bodies. And that's true. But many of these microorganisms are not designed to live in the human body. They were designed to ferment milk. And so we actually don't sort of have these microorganisms come into our body and, and colonize and live within us because they're not designed to do so. And so we're developing second generation antibiotics that were actually taken from people and designed to live in people and actually using those to develop next generation probiotics that can improve people's health. But in addition to adding individual bacterial species, we can also go about adding prebiotics. 
prebiotics are simply good food and good homes for microorganisms that already live within your body. You can essentially promote the growth of good things that you already have and limit the growth of bad things. So prebiotics can be things like fiber that really um, bacteria like to eat and can actually live in, and that can actually promote healthy growth of good species. But there's also some really cool things that are coming on board. One is phage therapy. This is actually using viruses against bacteria to target very specific uh, microbial strains that you want to eliminate from the gut so you can keep the good ones. And last but not least is probably everyone's favorite method, uh, which is called a fecal transplant. Um, and so <laughs> this is highly effective with people with particular bacterial infections. For example, Clostridium difficile, which is an infection people get when they're in a hospital for a long time, most frequently, and they're immunocompromised. If you um, sort of give people a fecal transplant with a Clostridium difficile infection, it's up to 95% uh, effective at stopping that infection. Antibiotics are only about 30% effective. And so this is a huge new revolution in our ability to treat infectious disease by simply thinking about how we might, how we might do this. So a fecal transplant is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's mostly a blender and a turkey baster, although it's done in a very scientific way these days. Uh, but it is taking fecal matter from another human, blending that up into a slurry, and using a, um, an injection sort of uh, system to actually put that back into the gut via a suppository system back into another human. And so you're essentially just delivering all the nutrients and organisms from another human into uh, that particular human. So there's been a lot of developments on this. Uh, the machine down here on the, the left side is called the RoboGut, which actually makes a simulated gut microbiome that people can use in, in fecal transplants. Uh, they had a couple other names for the system, one being the Repopulator, which was my favorite, um, but that has, has since been named RoboGut. There are also people working on things called poop pills, uh, which sound quite disgusting, but it's actually just putting those microorganisms in a pill that you might be able to swallow. The first clinical trial on this was highly unsuccessful. But there are a bunch more coming that are, are looking more promising. But on a daily basis, there's a lot of things you can do to try to improve your microbiome health. Of course, I'm not a medical doctor, but there are certainly things of advice that we know improve good gut bacteria. And so one of them is to eat healthy. Bacteria like eating fiber. They like eating complex carbohydrates. And they do this to pr produce sort of molecules that can communicate to your body and communicate to your brain and, and keep, you, keep you healthy. In addition, fermented foods usually have incredible microbial diversity compared to processed foods. And so eating fermented foods can actually help reintroduce some microorganisms back into the body. Another thing is to get outside. We know that we can try to rewild our microbiomes. We can try to expose ourselves to all these environmental microorganisms and reintroduce them into the body. So get outside, get into green leafy areas and, and roll around. Um, the next thing would be to reduce antibiotic use when it's possible. Obviously antibiotics or a miracle cure, they're fantastic. We just need to understand that they do come with risks and that you have to understand there are negative risks associated with antibiotics as well. And so to deal with those in a new way and think about them in a new way is something we certainly need to be doing as a, as a whole, as a population, especially as a medical community, and thinking about when to use antibiotics but also when not to use antibiotics. We also can remove antimicrobials from our daily life. You probably don't need that hand sanitizer with an additional antimicrobial in it. The alcohol in the hand sanitizer will do the job alone without sort of um, inciting uh, destruction of, of other microorganisms. But you can really get away without antimicrobials. Uh, try getting away without the hand sanitizer unless it's necessary. We can also try promoting healthy early life procedures, things like vaginal births rather than C-sections, again, if that's possible. And last but not least, we can all try to educate ourselves about microbiome health. And fortunately for us, there's a lot of amazing microbiome researchers that are writing really good literature. And so I've put up on the screen quite a few books that are actually written by scientists within this field that are trying to get information out about the microbiome to people like you, interested people. And so please feel free to, to check any of those books out. I've read them all, and they're actually very fantastic with, with great knowledge in them. And so as I leave you on to the next talks, think about what you did today that would influence your microbiome. And think about how your microbiome might contribute to your personal health or when you get sick the next time. Is that because your microbiome maybe wasn't as strong as it could be? And last but not least, how will your microbiome change in the future? Will it be something that you do individually on a daily basis? Or will your doctor actually be able to provide a treatment that manipulates or modulates your microbiome in a healthy way? With that, thank you. So thanks, Laura. That was really good. Yep, very exciting. Um, I dread to think where this research is going to end up. Um, um, and who's, who are we going to be patenting and, and marketing and things like that? Um, I'd rather be a poo donor than a poo recipient, personally, yeah.
Anyway, I'd like to introduce uh, Nicola Thompson. She's a senior lecturer here at the university in the Adelaide uh, Medical School. And um, she works on um, the links between nutrition literacy, which is unusual, yep, uh, dietary choices and health. And she's also a pro program coordinator of nutrition health major. Um, and your key focus is really pathways to obesity. So, are you right now to present? I'm good to go, I think. Okay, Mine's good. Working. Hi, so, yeah, as you said, my job is actually quite unusual. I'm what we call in Adelaide an education specialist. So my interests have really come from my background in nutrition science. My research was all in obesity, and I became more and more frustrated with the amount of poor information associated with diet and their impact on health that you can get on the internet these days. And so I thought about all of this and I thought, well, how can I have a big impact on the world? And what can I do that can really make a difference? And so I ended up teaching. And I ended up becoming a lecturer at the University of Adelaide. And I'm now a specialist. And I'm in particularly interested in how I can change education and through teaching people about nutrition and their, encouraging their knowledge and in nutrition, we can change their lifestyle and the choices that we're making with regards to our diet and our general health. So, I guess as I was given this topic today, I said, oh, what can we talk about in food that has a big impact on them? We have a major issue in Australia, okay? We're all eating too much energy. And one of the biggest energy sources in our diet is sugar. Australians love sugar. We eat, on average, about 60 grams of sugar a day. That's about 14 teaspoons of sugar. And this isn't just sugar that's incorporated natural sugars in food. This is added extra sugars in the form of things like table sugar or in sweetened drinks or in things like cakes and beverages. So if one way we can impact and change our choices is to try and get us to, uh, I guess, notice and observe where our sugar is coming on from our diet. So, we also have an issue with nutrition communication. So what a nutritionist and a scientist such as myself would talk about being sugar is very different to what these people who are writing their internet blogs and the advocates would actually refer to as sugar. And there's a lot of miscommunication in here. So we have specific regulation diagrams to help us define sugar. So one of the big health regulatory bodies of the World Health Organization, and they actually have a definition of sugar which is used worldwide. So this is the ones that nutrition scientists use to identify in food. So they define free sugar as those added to foods by the manufacturer, the cook, or the consumer, so the stuff you sprinkle on top, plus sugars that are naturally present in honey, syrup, so these are extracted and concentrated forms of things like fruit, fruit juices, which is the one that always surprises people, that's generally very concentrated product of fruit that gives you fruit that gives the really sweet flavour, and fruit juice concentrates. So when we're talking about sugar, we are talking about these items and trying to identify them and reduce them within our diet. So the recommendations interestingly, differ very much worldwide. And this is associated a little bit with how much diet we consume. So the Americans are recommending that they eat, you eat no more than 10% of your daily energy from sugar. And this is in line with the World Health Organization guideline. They say 10% of your energy from sugar. This directly translates into about 50 grams of sugar coming from that, those sweeteners. The UK has a little more strict guidelines. They recommend no more than 5% of your daily energy being from sugar. This is actually the World, Rec World Health Organization's long-term aim. So they've gone for the hardcore, really keep it restricted. Australia, unusually, and this surprises people, actually just says limit intakes of foods and beverage containing sugar. So we're quite, quite simply told, and that's because Australia likes to talk about food rather than the sugar itself. So our guidelines are to try and reduce the amounts of food which we consume, which contains sugar. So in Australia, where's our food coming from? And what does our dietary intake looking like? Well, this is the sad state of affairs. If we took that 10% regulation that the World Health Organization has recommended, that 50 grams of sugar a day, that's the higher level of recommendation. We have a massive amount of popula our population are actually increasing more than this. So the largest sugar-consuming age groups are teenagers. 
And they eat about 70% of the popula teenage population is consuming well above this 10% of a daily recommendation. The highest consumers are teenage boys who actually consume 72 grams of sugar a day. So that equals about 17 teaspoons. It's remarkable. And so you think, well, where's all this sugar coming from? And one of the biggest consumers, we, sources we have actually in our diet, showed in this uh, right-hand side diagram, is actually soft drinks things like Coke and lemonade. So it's like, well, why does this majorly consider such a large source? Well, the result is quite simply because of the amount it has in them. So if you take this bottle of lemonade, okay, we're aiming to get less than 50 grams if we follow the 10%. This bottle of lemonade, okay, if you just drank one of these a day, this contains 66 grams of sugar. You're already well over your recommendations. So that's why they are the biggest intake. And if you can think of the average teenage population picking up a bottle of lemonade, the bottles are getting bigger, we no longer consume cans, we're quite simply consuming more of these food items. So what are sugars? And this is where the biochemistry comes into it in the science. And this is where a lot of it has got very, very misinterpreted. So the main simple single sugar molecules are what we call monosaccharides. And the main monosaccharides I will talk about are glucose and fructose, okay? So glucose and fructose have an identical biochemical structure, okay? That's the scientific bit. They're all made up with six carbon molecules, 12 hydrogen molecules, and six oxygen molecules, okay? What this means is they have exactly the same energy content. So no one has more energy in than the other. But these com the way these molecules are structured and combined between glucose and fructose differs, okay? So glucose actually forms in a ring structure. It has a six side with each carbon at the corner of the, uh, of the diagram. So it has six points, it uh, forms a hexamer, okay? With a glucose at each corner. In the contrast, fructose forms this circular shape that looks like a pentagram, okay? What this means is that they're able to bind with different receptors differently. So this unique structure of fructose means that it's actually able to bind with receptors much more strongly, which induce a sweet taste. So fructose is the individual component that we get in sugar that makes it really, really sweet and makes us really want to eat it. You think, well, why has fruit developed this interesting, really, really sweet taste? And it goes back to the natural processes involved in food, fruit. The fruit wants to encourage the animals out there to eat it. By consuming the seeds, the seeds pass through the, through the rodent, the rodent travels to a different area, the seeds are dispersed in the feces in the different area and allows the plant to grow. So it's all associated with the natural present in plants and as a result, fructose developed to become really sweet to encourage animals to consume it. And humans are no different. We love sweet tense tastes. And because of its energy needs and its drive in the body to be able to support our energy needs, this sweet teeth taste makes it incredibly pleasurable and makes us want to, more, to eat more of it. So we don't generally consume our sugar in monosaccharides. We actually consume it in disaccharides, okay? So in Australia, we tend to have sugar, uh, sucrose being our main form of sugar in our diet. That's our standard table sugar. We extract it from cane, sugar cane to produce it and process it to form into sucrose. Sucrose is made up of 50% glucose and 50% fructose. It's quite simply one of those molecules combined together, which gives it, it's, because it's got the fructose in there, it has a really, really sweet taste. On the other hand, other disaccharides which exist naturally, so you've got lactose. Lactose is a sugar naturally present in milk. Lactose is a combination of the monosaccharide glucose and, gal and the monosaccharide galactose, okay? And maltose is another sugar out there, it's combined of one glucose combined with another glucose. Because maltose is two glucoses, glucose doesn't have an existing as sweet taste, so you actually don't get as much of a sweet flavor when you consume foods that contain maltose. So the unique thing about all of this is, if you've got a food that contains maltose, if you want to get the same sweet taste, you actually have to put more of the maltose in the sweet food to make it sweet. So you actually get much more energy density in the food as a result of using these less sweet and tasted foods. So we also have another thing about issue these days about fruit, okay? So this message of fructose being in fruit and being energy dense has been remarkably misinterpreted over the, over the program. There's absolutely nothing wrong with fruit 
Fruit is part of a gentle, general energy, uh, a general energy source in the body. Okay. The wonderful thing about fruit is it actually has something called fiber in it. Okay. So fiber is basically very long chain, long chain sucroses all combined together, which are unable to be digested and broken down in the body. So quite simply, they, do, they sit in the digestive system. They provide bulk to the digestive system. They slow the digestive process down and make you feel fuller for longer. So compared, if you're going to eat an apple, which has much lower level of sugar, it's going to make you feel fuller for longer. You quite simply can't eat as many apples. You can't get as much fructose from fruit sources. And therefore, they are never properly going to be an issue because you can't simply eat as many apples as you'd be able to get from your fruit juice sources. Fruit juice, in comparison, has purely extracted the juice from the fruit. To be able to get a significant amount of fruit juice, you need to combine and break down a significant number of apples. And as a result, you get very energy-dense, sugar-dense drink in the form of fruit juice, which is why we recommend to restrict the fruit juice because of the energy density associated with it. So there's also a lot of misinformation about this, how these products are combined and used by the body. So I'm going to give you a brief lesson in biochemistry and how fructose metabolism differs from glucose metabolism. This is another area which is a little bit misunderstood. So glucose is the main energy component, particularly for your brain. It's rapidly absorbed into your bloodstream from your digestive system. It travels on in your bloodstream. 30% of the energy from glucose and the energy used in your body is used to support your brain's function and used to support your nerve function. Your brain wants to use sugar to function. So if you remove too much glucose out of your body, you're going to end up suffering from fatigue and tiredness as a result of not having the glucose and not allowing your brain to use it as a source. Fructo uh, sorry, glucose can also be used muscle by muscle and is the main source of energy used in the muscle. So the muscle rapidly takes it up, use it to supply the energy for the contraction processes. Any extra glucose that your brain isn't using, your nervous system isn't using, your muscles aren't using, gets confirmed into a product called glycogen, which is quite simply stored in your muscle. The other main area that processes uh, energy is your liver. Okay? So your liver is able to take up glucose. It combines it once again to form glycogen and stores it there for later use should we need to do so and can release it in response to hormones. Fructose, on the other hand, is a little bit different. So fructose can't be used easily by most tissues in the body. So to be able to change it to a source that we need and we're able to use, we actually have to break it down and translate its structure. So fructose immediately, in general, I guess in general dogma, it goes to the liver and is converted first to glucose, and then glucose in any excess form is converted into fat. Fat generally is then transported by the body, it passes on down to adipose tissue in the body and gets stored as energy in your body and fat in your tissues. And there, you see, is the association between fructose and why some people consider it to be contributing remarkably to the obesity epidemic. Okay. The other issue with the liver is that if it's producing, it will favorably use fructose over glucose to produce fat. So if there's a massive amount of fructose in our diet, it'll metabolize it at a really high rate. It'll produce a massive amount of fat. That fat doesn't automatically get transmitted immediately to our adipose tissue. And it can abnormally accumulate in our liver. This abnormal accumulation of fat is extremely detrimental to our health causes something called hepatic steatosis and or fatty liver disease ultimately it occurs in a long time and gets, that, gets there to such a large level. And this has been linked with a type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance and insulin insensitivity and disease states. So the, our general dogma is that we would try to avoid fructose in our diet in its purest form and try eat, not eating too much to prevent fat accumulation. This story, I guess, has genuinely been associated with the fact that we need an enzyme to be able to translate and break down and, uh, I guess, mutate fructose and translate it and, and metabolize it. Previously, and this is, I'm talking early this year that this information actually changed, 
the liver was considered the only place that this enzyme ketohexokinase was actually synthesized by the body. So the general thoughts were that we can only metabolize it in our liver, therefore any really high levels of fructose in our diet is going to cause liver damage due to long-term accumulation of fat. It doesn't get metabolized anywhere in the body. We now actually know surprisingly that this isn't the case. And this has occurred through a very interesting study basically produced in rodents going to take a little, little piece of the salt because it's a rodent study, but generally rodents and their digestive system work pretty much the same. So what they discovered, that in low doses of fructose, uh, your intestine cells will actually metabolize the fructose. They'll break it down, they'll turn it into glucose, and all you'll end up doing is absorbing glucose into your bloodstream and not the fructose. So the fructose will never actually get to your liver and the body will work perfectly healthily to ma manage and regulate the glucose tab metabolism in the northern way. We only start to get issues if we get extremely high levels of fructose in our diet. If we overbear the ability of our small intestine to metabolize the fructose, it then starts to appear in our central nervous system. So if we're consuming it in very, very high quantities in our diet, then we start to get issues with having high levels gathering and potentially start to get the risks associated with uh, liver damage and liver processes. This research is all great, but no matter how scientists sort of translate this, it still somehow manages to get mutated in the public press and I mean. So immediately following this article, the economists picked it up with it. And you'd think they'd say, hey, hey, actually low doses of fructose are perfectly healthy, go away, eat plenty of fruit. But what happened was something really different, okay? The economists led with the headline that said basically two fructose may cause liver damage. With a little small print that said it's not supposed to leave the small intestine. How they could take what was considered by nutrition scientists and myself as such as a great article saying, hey, we were right, go ahead, eat fruit, to encourage people to eat more fruit into this sort of information is remarkable. And the article on the right-hand side was produced by The Telegraph. And their response in September this year was to actually discuss different forms of fruit and association with fibre and how fructose is absorbed from the fruit in relative to the fibre. And I think it's articles like this that frustrate me as a nutrition educator the most, because the ultimate message you get from that diagram is fructose. It's bad. You shouldn't be consuming it, and fruit most certainly is bad because it contains fructose. So what can we do about it? The biggest impact of all these issues is that the vulnerable people in the population are picking up on these issues. And recently we had a report from a clinic in Sydney which was investigating diabetes. And they had a unique observation that scurvy, something that we thought was an ancient disease, has actually started to come back and reappear. The issue with scurvy is a vitamin C deficiency. Vitamin C is prevalent in fruit and vegetables, a great source of vitamin C. And if you cut these out of your diet, in particular fruit, as a way to control your blood glucose because you're getting the wrong message from this science being literally translated wrong in the media, you end up getting messages that, hey, I shouldn't be eating them. And as a result, diabetes sufferers actually in this clinic in Sydney were avoiding eating fruit and vegetables to try and control their sugar intake in their diet. And sadly, they were suffering from impaired wound healing, and in particular, uh, blisters and ulcers, which is a real issue in diabetes. They were quite simply not repairing their ulcers, and they were having longer lasting ulcers as a result of their inability to have their low levels of uh, vitamin C in their diet. So this isn't actually unique to the diabetic population. The Australian population themselves are also not eating enough fruit and vegetables. And so this statistic is actually quite remarkable. The latest dietary survey says that females, only 54% of females actually eat the right amount of fruit in their diet. And only 10% of women eat enough vegetables in their diet. This isn't hard to do. It's quite simply five serves of vegetable. A serve is half a cup of vegetables. That's not very much vegetables, okay? So we only need to eat a small amount of vegetables to meet your target. But remarkably, only 10% of women are doing this. And even less men are doing this. I have no idea what men have an aversion to vegetables for, but only 4% of them actually eat the right amount of fruit and vegetables. So what should we be avoiding? It's certainly not fruit and vegetables because they're the one nutrient-dense rich food and they're great for a digestive system. How do we recognize the hidden free sugar in our diet? 
So fructose, uh, so sugars these days come in all sorts of forms. And then people have got really sneaky in there, calling them all sorts of different names, so you quite simply can't recognize them in your food. It's got very, very complicated. So general table management, I've, I've listed this in the sort of percentage of fructose and glucose in the sugars, just to give you an idea of why people have started, how the, how the poor messaging has impacted in the amount of the sugars we get in our diet. So general table sugar is 50% glucose, 50% fructose, because it's pure, uh, pure glucose. A lot of people out there are turning to what they call natural sugars because they think, well, these natural versions are actually more healthy. One of the ones we hear about is honey these days being natural, but honey has absolutely no different energy content to actually normal sugar, okay? It is quite simply pure sugar just processed by a bee, okay? What's that? <laughs> the biggest issue we hear about the link with fructose is that high fructose corn syrup, okay? And this is associated with the US population. Thankfully, we don't need to worry about this in Australia because we don't have high fructose corn syrup in our diet, okay? So this extract of glucose and corn syrup is quite simply something we shouldn't need to be concerned about. The one that we do need to watch out for are these two, and these are the ones that I quite simply see all the time on things like protein balls you get in the coffee shops, okay? One of them is agave syrup, which is extracted from cactus, believe it or not. It's considered an actual sugar, but it's actually 100% fructose. It is worse for you than high fructose corn syrup. And the other one is rice malt syrup. Rice malt syrup, believe it or not, is considered sugar-free. But that's purely <laughs> because it doesn't have any fructose in it. It's got exactly the same energy in it because it's any glucose, it's not a sweet, so what they actually end up doing is putting more food in it, more in, in the food, and ended up, being, uh, ended up being extra energy in there. So it definitely is sugar and it should be avoided. So a final side, I just wanted to give you a little bit of guidelines. So when you're looking out for the foods, what to be actually look out for. The key ingredients to look out for are the syrups, the nectars. Anything that ends in an os is a biological sugar. And those juices, which are concentrated fruit in some way, shape, or form. The key with reading your list when you've got your ingredient list on a packet, and unfortunately, they tend to keep these ingredient lists very, very small, so it's very, very hard to read. This is not accidental, may I work? They'll put it in a little corner. If you don't look too hard for it, you then won't be able to read it, so just generally move on. The key is to look for the ones that are further on in the list. So you can see this extract home is a list of, is a list of licorice, and you can see that the first of the five ingredients in this, in this uh, label are actually all sugar products in some way, but they're all differently labelled as different items. So there's treacle in there, just sugar, just sugar, glucose syrup, just sugar, sugar itself, they've uniquely identified it, and then molasses, which is just sugar. So they've broken it down so they don't look as important. And finally, the other little trick you need to look for is the breaking up down in the latter of the list. So these little slices down the bottom have sugar listed in numerous components, and I'm getting in trouble for talking too much. <laughs> and you can see to shift it down the list so it doesn't look as important, they break it down into individual items. So instead of listing sugar, they lift it under their complicated name. So it's actually got honey listed twice down at the lower end of the list to try and break it down so it doesn't look into sugar. They use the split trick. So the key is always to look at the 100 gram comment if you want in a nutshell to figure out how much sugar is. Look at the sugar component here, and quite simply, if it's more than 10 grams in 100 grams, that would represent more than 10% of the energy intake, and as a result, you should, I guess, avoid that product if you can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nic Nicola did warn me that she's uh, passionate and keen about her area, and she was likely to go over time, but uh, I wasn't sure she'd double the amount of time she thought she'd have, but anyway. Uh, I won't take up too much time now. The next speaker is John Schenken. Are you all electronically wired? That's good. So he's also an Australian Research Council Research Associate at the University in the Robinson Research Institute. Um, and his research focus is understanding the effects of mothers and fathers um, and the, their environment on their offspring, in a nutshell. Thank you, Ray. Good job. All right. Thanks everyone for coming along today um, and I hope you've really enjoyed it so far. I've learnt a lot already and it's been really fantastic. So what I'm going to talk about today is how everyday chemicals can impact fertility and pregnancy. Everyone loves reproduction. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I know Ray loves it. Um, and we all have a vested interest in this. Even if we don't have children or if we're not interested in having children, we all um, were born as a result of reproduction. So it's really important. 
So what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, a particular subset of chemicals that we expose ourselves to on a daily basis. And these are endocrine disrupting chemicals and the impacts that these can have on human health. So what are endocrine disrupting chemicals? Well, they are a broad range of chemicals that can interact or that interact with the endocrine system and produce a range of adverse effects in individuals. And if you look on the um, image on the right-hand side there, you can see that they can have an impact throughout the body. But in particular, they can have an impact in the reproductive systems. And the way that they do this is by um, having similar structures to some of our hormones, and they can then bind the receptors and elicit an effect. So if we look broadly at the impacts on human health, we can see it can have impacts on the reproductive system, endocrine system. We can also see it can have impacts on our immune system, as well as the cardiopulmonary system and the brain and nervous system. So there's very varied impacts of this. And for a long time, the research was focused on the impact of that exposure to an individual. But over the past 10 years, there's really been a shift in this um, interest here, and it's moving away from the impact on the individual, but looking at the impact during development. So the impact of exposures to mum, for example, during gestation and how this may impact um, their offspring. And the reason for this is that um, during gestation, there is a, a, a large window of, um, well, a large sensitive window of development, so where exposures can have an impact. And so it's really important we understand what these exposures are doing and the impact that they may have on our offspring and also on ourselves, of course. So how can these chemicals impact fertility and pregnancy? So as I touched on before, it's really, um, I guess previously we used to consider that parenting began at birth. But in fact, parenting doesn't begin at birth. It commences prior to birth and even prior to conception because the events that we expose ourselves to and our exposures in our environment um, throughout our lives can have an impact on the quality of the pregnancy and the health of the offspring. And it's not just about mum. Mum obviously plays an incredibly important role through that nine-month period um, of gestation where her exposures may be having an impact, but dad can play a role as well, and his exposures prior to conception can influence the quality of the sperm and the way the embryo develops and the quality of the pregnancy. So both parents play an important role. So in the context of how these can impact fertility and, I guess, reproductive health, um, in humans, there are limited studies, and the reason for this is that it's really challenging for us to go and specifically assess a particular exposure and the impact that is having on an individual or on their offspring, because we're exposed to many different things in our environment, so it's really hard to tell the specific exposures, and that's really where the benefits of using animal models come in. So we can take these animal models and we can put them in a controlled environment where we can specifically assess, assess, sorry, specifically assess a particular exposure and how that may be having an impact. We know that these exposures can have a negative impact on male and female reproduction, and they do this by mimicking estrogen and testosterone, but certainly more research is needed. So what we do know is that um, these exposures can change our hormone levels. They can decrease the quality of our male and female gametes, of our sperm and our eggs. They can lead to damage to the sperm. In um, mothers, they can alter their... or in um, Potential mothers, they can alter the menstrual cycle, they can increase the time it takes to become pregnant, they can increase the risk of miscarriage, and they can lead to early menopause. So these can have an impact not only on our capacity to become pregnant, but also on the quality of the pregnancy. And we're now beginning to look more and more at the impacts that these exposures have, not only on the capacity to become pregnant and to sustain a pregnancy, but also on the impact across multiple generations. And this is particularly well studied for maternal exposures during gestation. So as an example, studies have shown that phthalates, which are a plasticizer um, that are being exposed to mum during pregnancy, can impact not only her children, but also her grandchildren, um, and in ways of, in their reproductive function, but also in their behaviour. And the way this works, if you look in the bottom left here, you can see that the mother's exposures can obviously be transmitted to the fetus that's carried within her. But within that fetus as well, there are reproductive cells for that third generation, so there's that potential that that exposure there can also have an impact. There is increasing interest in the role of paternal exposures, so dad's exposures, and how this may have an impact, but less is known about this. So a great, or perhaps not great isn't the best word to use here, but an example of endocrine disrupting chemicals and their impact on fertility can be seen in diethyl stilbestrol. 
So this was used in the 1940s to the 1970s, and you can see the advertisement on the right here, um, which was really promoting how great it was to be used to prevent abortion, miscarriage and labour, and that you should use it in all pregnancies. 96% of um, people will have a live delivery, that's fantastic, and there are no side effects. Everything seems to be great with it. But unfortunately, there were some side effects, and the mothers that took this drug had an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, the daughters that were born from these mothers um, had increased risk of female tract carcinoma, so cancers of the female reproductive tract. They also had increased likelihood of having problems with fertility and pregnancy complications. And we don't really completely understand at the moment what's happened with the um, grandchildren from these mothers, but certainly you can see that there's a potential that there may have been an impact. So it's very concerning, and it's important we understand um, what we're exposing ourselves to and the potential impacts that they may have. So what are they? I've told you all about what they can do, but what are they and what should we be looking out for? So there are natural and artificial endocrine disrupting chemicals, and natural probably are the ones that we don't have to worry about as much. Um, things like soy, um, like tofu, um, flaxseed and things like that that we might be consuming in our diets contain phytoestrogens, which can act um, in a way by binding to the receptors um, and um, disrupting our endocrine system to some extent. And there are some studies out there that suggest that there may be some impact on male and female reproductive health. But um, it's very clear that we need to consume an awful lot of these foods to see an effect. And if we have a, a normal healthy diet, like we've been speaking about in the earlier presentations, I think it's quite unlikely that we'll be seeing some major impacts of these natural compounds. But it's the artificial compounds that are more concerning for us. Um, and there are around 800 artificial endocrine disrupting chemicals in everyday items. This isn't an exhaustive list. I've just shown you two examples here. There are many in many different environments. So things like pesticides that we might consume in our fruits and vegetables that we eat um, that are obviously sprayed onto our agricultural crops. Or that may even be in our backyard shed that we use to spray the lawn to get rid of some things. They can contain endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, bisphenols and phthalates are in plastic products, so things like um, cans or tinned goods, uh, plastic bottles that we might use, perhaps in cleaning the house or even to drink from, um, receipts that we get from the stores and also coffee cups. So when we go buy our coffees, the inner lining has plastic in it that contains some of these chemicals. And so these are all present, and as you can imagine, they're present in virtually, they're present in something that we will interact with on a daily basis. So how prevalent are they? They're obviously very prevalent, but if I was to take the entire population here in this um, lecture theatre and assess um, whether there are EDCs in them, would there be in you know, a lot or not so many? Well, it turns out that they're present in 95% of people tested. So that sounds concerning, but the degree of exposure varies. It really depends on our jobs, the lifestyle choices that we make, and also the location in which we live, because these can all influence the level that um, we're exposed to and the impact that it could potentially have. And remember, just because you actually have a detectable level of some of these compounds doesn't mean that we're going to have problems with our reproductive health. So what I have spoken about so far is really focusing on the impact of, human, of these compounds on human health. But we have a responsibility to understand the impact that it has on our environment and on our native species as well. And so Australian native species are quite vulnerable to these endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, as you can imagine, as I was talking about before in pesticides, these chemicals are abundant in agricultural areas. They're sprayed onto crops to try to um, help the crops grow and really you know, lead to better quality crops for us. But what these wallabies and kangaroos, for example, do is that they will be in these areas, they're quite abundant in these areas, and they will go utilise the dams and drink from the dams, which actually can be accumulating the runoff from these chemicals. These EDCs can then accumulate in fat and breast tissue, and they can actually have an impact on development in these animals. So an example can be atrazine, which is a pesticide that's commonly used in Australia, and that is known to have an impact on male development in wallabies. So that is, again, concerning in addition to the human health. So what can we do? Well, we could simply just pack up, move to the forest, maybe move to the Amazon and just live in the middle of nowhere. You know, that's the solution. But you know, we're not going to do that. And there are simple steps that we can actually take that can help us um, really reduce our exposure and become conscious of the exposures that we're making or that we're giving to ourselves. So simple steps. And, you know, these steps are important. I, I wrote here to consider when planning to start a family, but I think they're important in general that we consider. Um, and things like with our fruits and vegetables, we can wash them before consuming. Um, we can buy from known and local sources so we know the kind of pesticides that might be used and wash them away, and this will reduce our intake of chemicals sprayed on the plants. It will also support the local economy as well, which is always fantastic. Um, rather than using soft plastic bottles, we can drink out of glass or hard plastics. Um, the soft plastics contain these um, endocrine disrupting compounds and other, uh, like BPA, phthalates and plasticizers that can have an impact. 
If we bring in food to work or we get food at home that we've got from a takeaway shop in a plastic container, you know, often you'll just pop it in the microwave, heat it up. But rather than do that, use a china or a glass bowl to cover with paper and cover it with paper towel to heat it up because these objects, when heated, um, can be absorbed into the food. So the endocrine disrupting chemicals that are present in them can be absorbed into food. Even with coffee cups, and I haven't got this here, rather than using um, a coffee cup that's given to you by the store, bring a keep cup along. You know, you can get ceramic ones, you can get glass ones that are all great to use, and that, you know, not only are you helping the environment, but you're also, you know, helping yourself. So I find this quite depressing when I talk about this because, you know, it, it sounds really concerning, but I always, I think this is a great story to tell, and it shows how simple steps can make a major impact. So this is a story about Chiazi and Moato, which I've pronounced incorrectly, I'm sure. Um, and Kiazi is a southern white rhino, it's the mother that we can see here. And she was at San Diego Zoo and for 16 years they were trying to breed from Kiazi, which is really important when you've got such a critically endangered species like the southern white rhino. And they couldn't, they were having huge problems. And so the, the veterinary staff there were trying to work out what was going wrong and they were exploring many different options. And it turns out that her diet was really high in soy and alfalfa, in fact it was a soy only and alfalfa only diet containing high levels of phytoestrogens. And so she was basically only consuming that. And so they started to think about the impact that these endocrine disrupting chemicals or the phytoestrogens may be having on her reproductive health. And so they changed the diet. Within a few years, she actually was able to get pregnant and have a healthy little um, rhino calf, I think they're called. Um, and so, you know, small steps and small changes can actually have a major impact. So I thought I'd briefly finish by talking about what we're doing in this space. Ray hasn't got up yet. This is great news. Um, <laughs> And um, so what are we doing in this space? Well, I mentioned before um, how there isn't as much known about paternal exposures. And through a collaboration that we have with one of the University of Adelaide strategic partners, North Carolina State University, and a professor there, Professor Emily Risman, we've been looking at a particular plasticizer called DEHP that's detectable in most individuals. And what we've been doing is we've been using animal models and looking at if we give them a very low dose, what's commonly present in um, the population, what happens? So this is a low dose to the dads. And then we um, generate offspring from them that have been, like, so offspring from mums who haven't been exposed to any of these chemicals. Do we see any changes in the offspring health? And what we see is that um, changes in the anogenital distance, which is suggesting an impact of, their, um, of the endocrine disrupting compounds. So it's saying that there's been changes there. But I think what's really striking is we see changes in the male offspring behaviour. And actually we see less anxiety. So you can imagine in this picture in the bottom here, a mouse needs to be anxious. If you walk out of a hole and you see a cat there, you don't want to keep walking. You want to walk right back in and keep yourself alive. But when you don't have that anxiety, you'll just think, oh, that's fine, that cat looks good, oh, I'm happy. And you walk out and then things don't end up very badly. So you can see the impact don't, don't end up very badly, they end up very badly. You can see the impact that these um, exposures can have. So when we talk about paternal exposures and when we talk about the impact that they're having, it's important to understand what exactly is happening in dad that is causing these changes. And when we talk about this, we often think about damage to the sperm and changes to the composition of the sperm and the way it will communicate with the mother and it will lead to the development of the embryo. But what we are specifically interested in in some research that we're now doing in Adelaide is understanding a novel mechanism for this process and understanding how the male ejaculate um, can actually be communicating in different ways. And we know that the male ejaculate, also called seminal fluid, can actually influence the female reproductive tract. It contains molecules that communicates with the tract and it helps to program the female immune system for pregnancy. And so what we're really exploring here is whether changes that we see um, following exposure to these chemicals is actually impacting the way that this seminal fluid is communicating. And so if that's the case, we might have new mechanisms by which these changes are occurring and new ways in which we can explore to try to prevent some of these issues that might be arising. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging all of the people that are involved in the work that I've spoken about briefly at the end. Um, Professor Risman and her colleagues at North Carolina State University, the Robinson Research Institute, who um, is fantastic. It's really great to work here in Adelaide at the Robinson. It's a very great institute, as well as our funding bodies um, and obviously the Robertson Laboratory, led by Professor Sarah Robertson, which I'm part of. Thank you very much. When they give you these things, it's always an intelligence test to see if you know how to turn it on. Um, so we've come to the question time, and as you'd expect, any academics always run over time when they're given 10 minutes each to speak. So we're now 
a full 50%, 100% over time now. Um, and I, was, I produced a whole lot of questions to ask them, but I'm going to open it up to the floor, I think, first up. Um, and Bob Reason, before I grab somebody, gave me a list of three um, questions and I'll just ask one of them, and it could be answered by any one of them. So they ask, he asks, what would you be ex expected of the long-term effects of having your colon removed? Maybe you had colon cancer and you had it removed, and therefore your microbiome would be different. Uh, maybe your sugar absorptions could be different. Do we have any comments or answers to that for anyone? Well, I guess the biggest impact that you're going to have is your ability to divest, digest and break down food. The larger the surface area of your gut, the lot more nutrients you're able to absorb from your food. So one of the biggest impact of getting food, actually, parts of your digestive system is, is not being able to actually absorb nutrients, and in particular, energy, which is why you get patients who've suffered, I guess, had bowel cancer, et cetera, really struggling to maintain their weight, because contralaterally to the normal problem where people normally have more energy, they quite simply do not, are not able to extract as much energy from their food to be able to support their growth and maintain their body weight. That's probably the biggest impact. Absolutely, the microorganisms too are completely different. In many surgeries where you have a lot of the colon or part of the gastrointestinal tract removed, um, a lot of the tissue will start to remodel and, and some of those microorganisms will come back and actually associate with that new remodeled tissue. Um, but often it's, it can also sort of uh, end up in a state of disease as well where you have very different microbial species present. Okay, I see we've just got one microphone down here, so don't forget to share it around and I'll run around and hand it to people. Here we go, you, you had your hand up first. Yes, thank you. Um, Nicola, I think this question's to you, and it's in regarding sugars and cancer. There's been a lot of information out there about uh, sugar creates an inflammatory system which inhibits cancers from um, healing. Is, is there, you know, like, like the, the China study which has been debunked, is there any truth in that in regards to um, that, that you know of? With regards to the information about whether cancer cells actually eat more. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. 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 So just correctly summarise the question and then answer. Okay, yeah. So she was just asking me whether there's any difference between cancer cells and whether cancer cells actually thrive on sugar. I think that was what you were asking. The reality of this is there's actually no difference in the way cancer cells metabolise sugar, okay? Cancer cells are rapidly replicating. All our cells in the body need sugar to be able to replicate. So there is no difference between the process. If you eat more sugar, it's not gonna feed the cancer cells any differently to how it feeds any other cells in the body. So restricting sugar in your diet is not actually gonna have any impact on those cancer cells specifically because it's gonna impact on the whole of your body because they all metabolize in the same way. Does that answer your question, Clear? Yeah. Okay, next question. Yeah, um, I have friends that have a major problem with a child that has food allergies and I was just wondering whether from what the first speaker said that perhaps rather than looking at the irritants in the food that uh, cause the allergies, they should be looking at the microbiome in the child's stomach that's uh, reacting to foods that other people find okay in a more serious way. Absolutely, it's a great question. So the, the question is really about childhood allergies and whether or not we should be looking at the microbiome and not necessarily the foods that are causing these allergies. And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, and so much of the microbiome we think uh, in that early formulation of which species you're picking up uh, actually helps train the immune system on whether or not to react and when not to react. And so it's one of these sort of things where um, many of these early species that are present within the gut are actually very anti-inflammatory. And, and so they actually sort of support this, this gut environment with foods that would, that would support tolerance instead of activity or, or reaction against particular foods. And so there's actually some awesome clinical trials going on in Australia right now where they're, they're reintroducing peanut um, proteins that kid, children are allergic to and actually introducing at the same time with probiotics to sort of help train and educate the immune system at the same time to not react um, and to have that sort of anti-inflammatory environment when you're reintroducing peanut protein. Uh, it has an amazing effect. And so I think this will be something that you'll see come down the pipeline in five to 10 years as normal treatment to actually think about how we introduce microorganisms and how we alter the sort of microbiome in a way to help reduce food allergies. Yeah, hi, I've got a question about um, energy levels and maintaining energy levels in people who have recently had um, 
it's like bowel surgery. Um, so for example, my mum's had surgery a couple of weeks ago um, and she's got an ileostomy now and she's you know, obviously quite exhausted, but I'd like to know some information on maybe how you can alter your diet or how you, the types of foods you eat or even how you pre-process your food and whether or not that has an effect on how your body absorbs it. John, would you like to answer that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only uh, I guess my answer to that oh, question yeah. is, hey, this guy's a scientist down here, and what we always say is everybody is different and the way their body works is different. If you're suffering from some kind of disease, you need to know personal advice specifically for your condition. So going to see a dietitian in such situations would be the right thing to say and the right thing to do because if we were to make recommendations that we would never offer advice that was going to be detrimental to somebody's health. And I guess that's the difference between what we do and what other people do. We're incredibly careful about the information that we would give. We will never sort of offer information that might be wrong and might make somebody's health potentially worse. So in such a situation, I would go see the experts, go see the specialist and the special dietitians out there who are particularly focused on dietary impact and particularly guts and people who've had uh, colon cancer etc and parts of their guts removed and to be able to tailor their diet according to the bits of the guts that's missing and the bits of the guts because different nutrients are absorbed in different parts of the digestive system as well so to be able to tailor them for whatever it would be that would be impacted specifically according to their direct surgery good answer, good answer. Uh, next question uh, my Thank question you. is regards um, when in years past people were given long-term low-dose antibiotics for acne does that have a long-term health effect or can you actually um, can your body recover from that I don't know where you are can you raise your hand Ah, okay great I was like I'm just looking at the car um, absolutely so long-term uses of antibiotics were not really assessed in terms of risk they were only assessed in terms of, of the benefit for example treating acne in that in that individual um, there's been a lot of research that's gone into looking at different types of antibiotics and how they would impact the microbiome over long time long time periods and then to look at how the microbiome may repair itself or may recover after that antibiotic treatment has stopped um, absolutely different antibiotics have different potencies and actually can completely destroy the microbiome in, in different ways. So things like macrolides, people's gut microbiome never recover after that in most cases. Things like penicillin has much less of an effect and, and quite often everyone recovers. Um, and so it definitely depends on the type of antibiotic you were given and how long that course was given for. Uh, but absolutely these things can have negative impacts and risks that have to be assessed and we have to go back and think about how we're using them and, and how uh, we might use them differently today. Can I, can I ask a question, and I'm going to bring John into this uh, discussion because he seems to be left out a little bit, but I was just interested about the microbiome in the vagina and whether um, the seminal fluid from the male is affecting that and whether that has any effect in, in, in fertility in a couple. Thank you, Ray. Yep. Still a bit of a hairy question. Um, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> um, so look, the, I think um, there, there's a huge amount of increasing interest about the microbiome in reproduction and it, it clearly is playing an important role. Um, in terms of, so you raised questions was in relation to um, the immune system, was that correct? Or well, just no, in or fertility? On the microbiome, as well as the immune yeah. system, if you want to talk about that. So I guess, um, you know, we, we don't really understand the impact that it is having, I guess, on reproduction. We know, for example, that um, you know, there's a lot of studies going on in the, the sense of later on in pregnancy on the impact of um, the microbiome on um, preterm birth and how there might be dysregulation of particular microbes in the female reproductive tract that might actually be stimulating preterm birth. Um, but in the sense of um, the impacts on fertility, I'm sure there's a lot of great studies that could happen in that space, but I'm not sure of any of them off the top of my head or whether they have happened. So there's quite a few studies looking at the vaginal microbiome and fertility, and absolutely there is an association there, but nobody knows exactly what's completely healthy because the vaginal microbiome is very different in different human populations. Um, the same thing with the ejaculate microbiome. It's very different for different men across different populations, and that is put into the woman, and so how that has an influence nobody sort of understands yet. Um, 
That said, though, in looking at your research, I would love to sort of do a cross-comparison study where you look at the compounds you're looking at and we look at the impacts of the microbiome on the same time. I don't think these things are independent, <laughs> and it's probably knock-on effects. You know, if, if you have these sort of influences on, on the immune system and have impacts on fertility, you're probably going to have impacts on the microorganisms in the body as well. And so, so understanding how those interplay with one another and how they combine or don't combine or, or counteract each other. Maybe there's bacteria digesting these compounds in the gut that we haven't found yet, right? Um, and so how do, we, how do we sort of understand how they work together? I'd love to do that. So for some reason I know that um, semen is very rich in fructose, um, and I have no idea why I know that fact. <laughs> um, but also since we're talking about uh, agave syrup, I'll put a plug in for the agave americana, that's the cactus you were talking about. So it's the source of tequila, so you know it's much better to be making tequila than then, and then the syrup from the sound of things. All right, so do we have any more questions? I can see one person. Yeah, guest, please, go ahead. You've got the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I just had a question um, around the um, poo transplant. <laughs> so be keep, um, keep the microphone to you. Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Um, you mentioned, um, Nicola, that um, the, the flora or the microbiome sort of stabilises at around three years old. And my understanding is, um, you know, you can take probiotics, but they don't necessarily change uh, long term uh, the microbiome. So, is there much data on how long, say, uh, a transplant, fecal transplant, holds, or does it change everything for a long period of time off good? Yeah, that's a great question about how long a fecal transplant will last in a human. There's a lot of ongoing trials that are actually looking at that in greater detail, especially now fecal transplants for Clostridium difficile infection are actually an actual medical treatment. For a long time, they were still considered experimental. And so there was a lot of uh, paperwork and, and rigmen row around doing those sort of procedures on people. But now because it's, it's more mainstream, we can, we can do those. Uh, the short answer is, is that some of it depends on the donor. And in the initial studies, they didn't sequence the bacteria that were present in the donor. <laughs> they just made sure there weren't particular pathogens and harmful things there, but they didn't know about all the, the healthy bacteria that were present. Um, and so a lot of it depends on what you're actually given and how well those particular microorganisms sort of jive with what you have genetically as well. And so there's gonna be a lot of research moving into that um, forward. Some people, it's a, it's a permanent fix, they're all good. Um, and some people will relapse uh, in a several months, so three months or so. so. So we don't quite understand exactly how long those sort of things stay around and, and how long, um, you know, as somebody goes throughout their life and if they can maintain that healthy microbiome, how it fluctuates and how it changes from that initial donor microbiome. We still don't have the longitudinal data to answer a lot of those questions. Um, hi. So my question is, if antibiotics affect the microbiome, and in, in South Australia we have a lot of people from different countries who've come in with different microbiomes who may not have had the same access to antibiotics. So could it be that with our population diversity we actually have the answer within their microbiome to help improve the overall health of South Australia? I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Do you want to review my grants, please? <laughs> um, so, so absolutely. People of different ethnicities and different evolutionary histories have different unique microbiomes. Aboriginal Australians, our research and other research has shown that they have a unique microbiome compared to ca Caucasian Australians. So absolutely, we do have unique species in people walking around today that we can try to essentially biobank and, and preserve in case you know industrialization continues on and, and we see this continuing decrease in the microorganisms that we have associated with antibiotics and industrialized lifestyles. There was an excellent paper that was just written uh, last week in Science, which is a top, the top you know, sort of journal in our field, uh, basically calling for that, calling for people to try to biobank these microorganisms because they're disappearing and they're disappearing fast. And the likened analogy was to climate change, was to really, you know, we're seeing this sort of really big alteration in the Earth's ecosystem, that's happening on a micro scale as well inside of our inside of us. And so, people who are hunter gatherers today, um, people who live you know traditional lifestyles, they are a tremendous resource for the rest of us. Um, and so, figuring out ethically how we do that and how we do that in a respectful manner uh, is sort of I think the next big hurdle. And ensuring that that people are treated correctly as that process ensues. But but absolutely, you know, reaching out to the diversity of, of people and, and understanding how we can come together with our microbiomes to help solve the, the diversity microbiome crisis is, is an awesome idea. 
Thank you. Um, thanks so much for sharing your research and thanks particularly for linking back to the natural environment because I think that's one element that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, forgive me if this is a bit of a silly question, but I wanted to ask, with all the research that you're doing and how quickly it's obviously changing, how is that communicated to people who are already practising in the medical field and giving advice, um, given that they're often very time poor? I'll take a very quick stab and then I'm going to pass this on to let other people. For us, the microbiome field has been incredibly slow to integrate into the medical field. It's also a brand new field. It's only been around for about 13 years. And so only now we're starting to just give lectures to medical students who are going through med school. And so it's been slow. But some, there are some practitioners who are amazing and who actually take on that new knowledge and try to apply it in their practice. Um, so for us, it's been an incredibly slow process, but it's, it's getting somewhere finally. <laughs> I guess maybe I can talk about it a little bit because it's not only the microbiome that's got the issue, nutrition itself and education, and I guess that's where my passion lies to try and increase it. For a long time, I guess nutrition has been incorporated into the medical field purely through different topics. So when you talk about sugar, you talk about it through talking about endocrinology and disease states such as diabetes. There's been a massive shift towards this, and more recently we're having a push to try and increase actually and identify the nutrition within the education. So it is a uh, the national, uh, world international uh, decade for nutrition, education and literacy. So there's worldwide groups and one of which is being put based in Cambridge in the UK working to develop uh, medical uh, and teaching programs to educate health professionals in particular to try and teach them about nutrition. And it's not only the health medical professionals that need an increased uh, knowledge in their, are not confident in their knowledge of nutrition, it's dentists as well. So dentists can recognise a lot of nutritional deficiencies in the mouth, scurvy being a great example. Uh, speaking to the dental colleges, they've noticed that there's been an increase in scurvy in particular in the northern regions of Adelaide and they've noticed it be gum, gum bleeding within the mouth makes it a sign that there are these problems. So even the dental professions as well are really working to improve increased nutrition literacy and education. And I guess that's what I do as my living to try and develop uh, sort of models and education models to try and improve the literacy in these health professionals as well. So, yeah, I guess there's a, a number of different ways it can happen. I mean, part of it is through these events here where we're, we're sitting here and we talk to the, um, you know, the, the general population and you guys might take something away from it and go and talk to your medical professionals about things. Um, from a reproductive point of view, the, the Robinson Research Institute, which is here at the University of Adelaide, is really, I think, fantastic in this space. They have, um, it's a combination of not only basic scientists but also clinicians. So there's this opportunity for us to interact and we can talk about, so the clinicians can come and talk about the problems that they're facing in the clinic, but also the basic scientists can try to come up with problems that will help solve that. And it's this really nice integration that can occur. And so you have that as well as obviously always interacting with the people that are involved. So, you know, you talk about stakeholders and interacting with all these people. So we publish the papers which talk about perhaps basic science or a link with clinic, clinical science. We go to conferences and we talk about the work there. And there's always this interaction going on between the basic scientists and the clinicians in a lot of different fields that can really lead to like these really great outcomes that we see coming from, you know, all over the world. Hi. Um Hi. Hi. So, I was curious to do with the uh, the, the microbiome in the gut and um, what you were saying about early life, early development, and how those bacteria interact with us, um, or to do with the the reproductive effects. Um, I was wondering if anyone's traced uh, the likes of gluten intolerance or Crohn's disease back into your fields of research. <laughs> Great question. So whether or not gluten intolerance or Crohn's disease is linked to the microbiome. Crohn's disease has been completely linked to the microbiome and fecal transplants have actually been used to try to treat Crohn's disease um, with some efficacy. I think it's about 65% off the top of my head. So um, absolutely there's a, there's a problem in the microbiome with people associated with Crohn's, but it's a bit of a chicken in the egg. So is it the problem with the gut that causes the problem with the microbes or is it the problem with the microbes that causes the problem in the gut? Um, we think it's probably probably in the human side causing issues with the bacteria and then that sort of propagates. <laughs> so it's a, it's a tricky, it's a very complicated system to try to understand how hundreds of microorganisms are communicating to the human body and how they respond to that. Um, that said, people have also looked at uh, gluten intolerance and uh, and then a lot of the initial studies, they didn't sort of find microbiome associations with, um, for example, celiac disease, which is, you know, I guess, uh, you know, more, uh, 
prominent <laughs> type of, of gluten intolerance. Um, it's the actual disease, I guess, associated with it. Uh, and they didn't find associations, but that said, uh, they just published a study last year where they looked at over 10,000 individuals, and now you do sort of see an association between that, that sort of gluten usage um, and intolerance and the microbiome. And so I think it was just a sample number problem where you had to look at enough individuals because it's a very slight effect. Um, but absolutely, we think that these microbes and, and what you have early on in life and how you're being exposed to foods with the right types of microbes at the same time will play into really long-term effects on whether or not you develop food allergies. Um, so it's something that's actively going on. John? Um, oh, look, I can just, you know, in the sense of those, you know, autoimmune kind of conditions, we know that the immune system plays a really important role in reproduction and that changes to the way the immune system functions can obviously have an impact on our reproductive capacity and the quality of the pregnancies that we have. Um, so, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. But, you know, the immune system is always playing a really important role. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for this fantastic talks. Um, and uh, as we all know, with females getting uh, more and more get, uh, the higher education, it's becoming a trend that they may get married or have children later. So considering now compared with 10 or 20 years ago, it's quite different. And also compared to uh, men, women, I mean, their fertility before 20 and after 40 is very different. Um, I think there are uh, exceptions for both genders and ages group, but generally true. So my question is, um, with our knowledge and science about nutrition and microbial and uh, uh, avoiding exposure to uh, adverse environment, how far do you think this can get us go compared to this, like, this is quite a practical question, like for PhD students, for example, when they thinking about this. Yeah, thank you. So can I just double check, um, just make sure I understand the question. So you were asking, um, about the, whether it be nutrition or microbiome or um, exposures, um, whether that may increase our reproductive lifespan, is that...? Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, uh, compared to the law of the nature exists, so even we, we pay attention to this, how far do you think we can change it? I think, that, okay. does it make sense? I think so. Um, so I think, obviously, you know, in, from a reproductive point of view, you know, it's always great to try to have the best, um, you know, to have the best, I guess, diet that we can have that'll um, give us the healthiest lifestyles, and that will give us a good microbiome, and that will give us increased capacity to um, become pregnant, sustain a pregnancy, or to father a child if you're a dad. Um, in the sense of whether we'll be able to, by having a better lifestyle, whether we'll be able to expand our reproductive, I guess, window, I think it's more that the, the poorer lifestyles may actually reduce the window that we have. So we need to be looking at, you know, the better lifestyles will give us better capacity, but we always need to be conscious that the quality of our gametes just naturally with age actually get worse. So the, the earlier that we have children, the better quality of the gametes and the better outcomes that we, uh, we tend to have. And the same for, well, that was, that was in reference to both males and females as well. So the quality decreases for both men and for women as well. So it's not just about um, women being of a particular age, but it's both men and women, you know, and the earlier the better. Yeah, hi. Um, this is for you, Laura. Um, I'm just wondering, is Australia conducting any faecal transplants? And if not, is it looking like it's somewhere in the future, somewhere in this country? So the question is whether or not people were conducting fecal transplants uh, in Australia. So, so absolutely, there was actually a clinical trial here that I think is pretty much wrapped up um, here at the, um, the Royal Adelaide Hospital that was a couple years ago looking at inflammatory bowel disorders and doing fecal transplants in those individuals. And um, there's a lot of really amazing research that'll come out of that with Sam Costello leading the way. Uh, so. Um, you know, I think the, the results on fecal transplants are that they're really, really great for some specific things, like in a Clostridium difficile infection. They're maybe okay for other things, like inflammatory bowel disease, and they may not help, you know, necessarily at all in, in other particular conditions. And so how we use fecal transplants will probably be very much tailored to an individual and, and their disease stage and, and why and how their disease has manifested as well. So 
even the, the clinical trials that, that have run, you know, certainly we're going to use that data to try to make it better and, and better and, and tailor the results as we go. Okay. One question over here. Yep. Um, so just in regards to the um, soft drinks being such a large portion of our sugar intake, um, do we know the effect of artificial sugars in, in soft drinks and other foods? That's a very good question. And there's actually a whole research group based in Samui who are really interested in the links between artificial sweeteners and their impact and potential links with obesity. So the interesting thing about artificial sweeteners is they bind with the taste receptors. And there's a lot of gut hormones which are produced by our digestive system, which are able to introduce induce satiety. So the nutrients in the gut, it releases these hormones, they signal to the brain, it can su suppress and control our appetite. Some of these artificial sweeteners are in fact able, and this research is in early days, actually able to influence the ability of these uh, hormones to be released and their ability, I guess, not to release them and inhibit their release. So actually they uh, prevent, uh, I guess, as feeling full from food if we're consuming these artificial sweeteners. So it's early days, it's very sort of early research. With regards to health, the benefit of artificial sweeteners is significant in the fact that if you're quite simply replacing sugar in the through the artificial sweetener, you're massively reducing your energy intake. So if somebody's already going to consume the soft drink, they like sweet things, by replacing it and removing the sugar and using the artificial sweeteners, you're actually massively reducing the energy content in your diet, and they're extremely beneficial for that purpose. So Yes, there is research to say that it may interfere slightly with some of our regulatory processes and our metabolic processes, but overall, I think the benefits of using these for individuals who generally are trying to reduce the energy content of their diet probably outweighs any slight risk that may be associated with interference with satiety signaling and hunger signaling in the body. Yeah. I'll actually just add to that really quickly. There's a beautiful paper looking at the microbiome associated with the artificial sugar use, and it actually has a completely distinct effect that's actually quite negative. So it increases your intolerance for glucose um, by mediating the sort of microorganisms and their ability to signal to the right hormones in the body. Uh, so in that regard, regular sugar is much better for you than, um, than these artificial sugars. So we've got one last <coughs> I had a question for the second speaker. I'm sorry if it's off topic, but I was just wondering about uh, what some other resources for just finding information um, about like nutrition and stuff. Uh, if like obviously the newspapers don't always get it right, like what are some good resources for someone who's not an expert in this field? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> I guess the biggest issue is to try and to stick, uh, to stick to the people who actually know what they're talking about. So there's a lot of people, <laughs> and how do you identify them? So there's a lot of people out there who call themselves doctors that aren't actually expertise in the area that they're talking about. There's journalists who publish out there, publish diet books, because they've discovered it's a great way of marketing them. There are a few great researchers. There's a guy called Tim Crow, uh, who's an Australian researcher. If you want to look at a website, he has a webpage called Thinking Nutrition. So if you're interested in a great source of information about all things diet, and he's particularly interested in diet communication, his website is a fantastic resource to find out sort of well-communicated information about these areas. There's another great resource, which these guys might go talk There's a website called The Conversation, which is basically academics from all over the world discussing uh, contemporary topics on their areas of research expertise. And they have a massive amount of information there on nutrition. So if these guys will translate the science and tell you whether or not the information is true. And they do a lot of myth busting as well. So these sources, if I was going to recommend them, they will be a great source. But I guess if somebody is associated with the university, they're an educator associated with the university, they've got a PhD, a particularly associated with that area. That's probably the biggest, uh, I guess, giveaway of that they have uh, general knowledge in the area. If they don't tend to tell you what their background is, it's a big sign that they're probably uh, trying to make a little bit of money at you. And generally, if they've got something on the front page that's trying to sell you something, that's a good sign that actually they probably don't know what they're talking about because they're just trying to sell you a product. Probably we should the stop you there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. OK, I need to wrap it up. Uh, I'd like to thank our three speakers tonight. So Nicola, Laura and John, can you all Give a hand to them, please. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for participating. Um, thanks very much for asking lots of questions, because that saves me asking a lot of dumb ones myself. Um, but you could see there was a lot of interest in this whole area, and I'm really pleased that the university was able to put this on. 
So there is another event coming up on the 13th of November and it's our last research Tuesday for 2018. And the topic is herd immunity harvested. So this is about the men meningeal cockle bee study that Helen Marshall was putting together here um, uh, recently. And I'm sure that's gonna be very popular. So if you wanna get a ticket, uh, get online fairly soon and start booking. So again, thanks for coming and hopefully we'll see you here again in another month's time. Thank you.